Welcome to another episode of the Optimizing Mother podcast. It is very, very, very exciting um, for me to host the one and only Mrs. Dina Rosenfeld, um, who lives in Crown Heights, and she's the editor-in-chief of a high publishing. She authored over 20 children's books, including, of course, Labels for Label. And on a personal note, it is, you know, such a pleasure because I've worked with Mrs. Rosenfeld so many times, both at a high. Um, and I grew up together in the building in 555 Crown. So I feel like I get to interview someone who, you know, has been an older friend and mentor and someone I always admired and someone that I worked with, you know, in the field of children's books. So this is really exciting. And Mrs. Rosenfeld also um, conducts mikvah tours and workshops locally in Crown Heights. And I recently also was kind of on an episode together with her on that topic. So this is really great. Hi, Mrs. Rosenfeld. Welcome. Hello, it's so nice to be here. Yes, so Optimizing Mother podcast um, for mothers from Bisrifka and wherever else this travels. Um, I would love to just dive right in because, you know, you have such vast experience both with raising your children and with your work and and teaching that I'd love to get your insight. Um, And I I, want to just like dive right in. So I know how creative you are and how, how imaginative you are. Um, I mean, just just read your books, right? So I, I would love if you could share with us a little bit about what role does creativity play in our mothering? Well, I'd like to say, before I even start, start, start talking about creativity, that I am here um, with the intention of inspiring mothers without making any mothers feel guilty. Because mm. every time I went to a, any any kind of parenting event or listened to a parenting lecture, inevitably I came away feeling so overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, I have to make all organic food from scratch. And I have to <laughs> <laughs> I have to wake up at six in the morning and put on my makeup and wake each t- child lovingly and make their favorite breakfast. Like, uh, come on, we can't, we just can't. But the Rev spoke about the... I guess the advantage or the mila of what Nesheibna Sisral have to offer when it comes to chinuch of young children. And I'm sure people remember this because the Rebbe mentioned specifically something that has to do with the creative arts, which is music, that, um, that Jewish mothers from time immemorial would sing to their children, even children who are pre-verbal, tiny babies in the, right, in the, in the, you know, in the crib, uh, sing to them, Tyra is the best aspirer. And giving, transmitting values through creativity, a creative medium like music, like song. So that's really what I'd like to focus on tonight. Um, how mothers can bring the warmth and the love and the creativity in a in more of a fun way and a deep way um, than just the other mothering tasks that, that, have, that, are, that are the part of the day-to-day. The feeding everyone, making sure they zip their coats, making sure they take a bath, making sure they brush their teeth. It's such an overwhelming thing to care for children, just food, clothing, shelter, right? (laughs) Changing of the season, changing of the size. Yes, (laughs) Yes. so the shopping and the planning and the the way, you know, the uniform. It's just, it is very overwhelming. And my children are older now, but I will always tell a young mother, I I feel you. (laughs) It's not easy. It's nonstop. I was never as exhausted as when my children were so little. Wow. So much. Right, so my goal tonight, again, is not to make mothers feel inadequate or like they're not doing enough, but hopefully to offer them um, like a buffet of options that bring creativity to these, you know, kind of work-a-day tasks. So what if a mother's listening to this and she's like, I'm just, I I don't think I'm the creative type. (laughs) That's That's where I think we can always find a point of creativity. Some people are creative geniuses in the kitchen. You give them food, you give them a food challenge, and suddenly they whip up something, you know, delicious and interesting, and that's where their creativity lies. Or you have people who are creative um, with nature. You were telling me about a previous podcast. We're talking about, you know, how to enliven your children's lives, but with with nature, creativity in nature, collecting leaves, and, and you know, just marveling at, at the creations of Hashem. These are all creative tasks. We can we can broaden this topic. You know, everybody has something. And I and I recently gave a course um, in Beis Rivka Seminary 
focusing on the creative arts in the classroom. And the thing I, I realized that the things I was telling to the students is something that mothers could also incorporate in the home because a lot of the students, frankly, in seminary didn't want to teach or didn't see themselves as teachers, but I felt the course was still valuable to them as future mothers. And when we say the creative arts, we're really talking about the classic ones like music and movement, literature, the visual arts, when children draw, color, and do, again, not crafts, we're talking about art, uh, creative art, which is, you know, a form of self-expression. And the reason I'm so passionate about this is because children spend most of the time and most of the day performing tasks that are going to be graded or are on a scale of, you know, from good to better to best. And when it comes to the creative arts, there really is no such thing as a bad picture. If your three-year-old draws something, no matter what it looks like, the value is not in terms of a career in art. You're not going to take it to a museum and say, look, my three-year-old drew this, let's frame it. But what you're going to do is look at it and say, what is my child trying to tell me? What is my child trying to express? And that, in that sense, there's no such thing as you know, a bad piece of art or a bad poem or a bad, you know, there can't be. So that's really where I want to uh, focus our attention tonight on what our children are trying to express and tell us and give them lots and lots of ways of doing that. It's interesting. I mean, you started talking about it, how you're, you're giving it over to students and you feel like it would help them as mothers. But could you expound a little bit, like, why do you feel creative arts are so important in parenting. And from what I'm understanding, by the way, is you mean like giving children the opportunity to be creative. Is that correct? Exactly. That's so important in parenting. Well, it's important in parenting and teaching because if you sit down with your child and you review the olive base, right? That's again, Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a task that has, everything has a right and wrong answer. You point to a Samach, they say that's a Lamed that is incorrect. You're going to have to correct them. You're going to have to, you're learning, you know, subjective knowledge is everything ha- it has a right and a wrong. So one of the exercises I did with the students is I, I gave them an Olive Bay's worksheet. And I said, okay, they completed the worksheet by coloring in the Olive a certain color, the Bay's a certain color. And I said, now I know something about what you know, but I know nothing about you. So turn the page over. And on the other side, write and draw your favorite Olive Bay's letter and why you love it the most. So suddenly, we were in a whole different world. Suddenly, that would be a fantastic bulletin board. And the responses that I got were so beautiful and simple and interesting and revealing about each student. So it was like, I love, it ranged from, I love men because my name is Mushki and it starts with a man which is great. Oh, you like the first letter of your name, which be great. Some were like, I like Faye because it's swirly and happy. Mm-hmm. Like, wow. I love Lamed because it reminds me of a giraffe with a long neck. And it was just like, what a difference. So it's almost like relationship building. It is exactly relationship building. And then when you have an opportunity, some point to find a a prize or a toy with a mem on it and you buy it from Mushkin, you say, I remember that this is your favorite letter. Suddenly there's also this tremendous recognition of the bond of, of saying to a child, what you feel matters to me and I remember it. So how do you open all these conversations? It can't happen in a vacuum. You can't just suddenly sit down with a child and say, let's talk. Let's have a DMC. It doesn't work like that. But in the course of creative activities, you can, again, glean a great deal and elevate the whole relationship and the language within your home. So that's what, that's what we're talking about. I'm not trying to add work. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is like the, like Tanya talks about, by spending those extra moments, you know, maybe before supper, you, you know, the kids are doing homework, but you take that extra few minutes to let them color something, to hang it on the fridge. And you have the conversation surrounding their creative contribution. It's a different kind of conversation. And it's, you know, Mrs. Roosevelt, what happens though? Like you sit down, you tell your, you know, you, you have the pen, the paper, whatever, and your kid tells you, like, it happens to me sometimes. Like, mommy, could you make me a picture of, and he asked me to make a picture of whatever that he feels is out of his leak. How would you answer that? Well, one of the most effective ways to get a child to draw something, to attempt to draw something that seems like they can't do, is to examine it more closely. So when I was teaching preschool, and the kid said, you know, we were drawing Shacious May Voracious all kinds of objects. And they say, I can't draw a tree. I can't draw the." We'd go outside and look at a tree 
and feel the bark and look at the roots and, and, and look up at the branches. And then I got wonderful tree drawings um, when the kids noticed all the parts. And when we drew people for, you know, the sixth day and they had to draw themselves, I would bring a mirror. So I could say, oh, yeah, so you drew your face. What comes next? And they suddenly started noticing that people have necks. <laughs> and all the drawings had necks. It was very cute. Eyebrows, you know, we talk. The more you notice, drawing is about noticing. So I never, I, I advise to never to draw for a child, even though it's easier. Can you draw me a flower? Can you make me a tulip? You know, but to examine the object better. And then it builds their confidence. And they stop asking you to draw for them. And they start. But really, they, their they, art they takes off on their own. Exactly. That's great. That's great. I remember if it's okay for me to say sure. coming to your yeah. house and like there was like a like an entire row, like a border on your on your wall at the top. Like a some people have like wallpaper. You have like a wallpaper of like children's drawings. I remember some seven seventy up there, no? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't forever, but it's yeah, at some point and also like I remember before every Yuntif hanging like a, ribbons across their bedroom. And having them tack little decorations that they made, little dreidel shapes or menorah shapes and yeah. hanging them up. So they had something to look at when they fell asleep. I mean, but honestly, Sarla, that was only on a good day, you know, <laughs> most days. <laughs> I only remember was, the good days. That was on pizza night when I wasn't cooking and cleaning up, you know, like th these were planned things and things that the kids really looked forward to. And I also, you know, I was prepared for somewhat of a mess, you know, when kids are cutting out dreidel shapes you're going to get scraps of paper on the floor but you know it's it's not an ev necessarily for every single day but it is definitely a fun way and a um a very effective way of get of of getting to know your children better and ha giving them something at home to look forward to that doesn't sound like ch a checklist so can you okay, give everybody ideas can you give us like specific examples of of like ways to incorporate creative arts in the home Okay, well, first thing I'll, I'd say is for me, it was really important to control the art materials because when you have children of all ages, you're going to get scribbles on your walls if you're not controlling the art materials. So I actually made a place in my kitchen on a high enough cabinet that I decided when to bring down the markers and I decided, you know, when to bring down the crayons. And, you know, it was a great way of, of, of the kids helping to clear off the table because then I only had one table at the time. The one table, um, no People are in, in, in Crown Heights certainly don't have an art room or a special art table or anything. Um, yeah, I like when it's everyone around the table working together, all the, the art materials in the middle, and even a baby in a high chair. If they're not going to eat the crayon, you know, they can start using it and experimenting with it. So it's it's very um, motivating. Sometimes I would do it before bed. I'd say, you know what? If, as soon as everyone gets in pajamas, let's sit down and we'll color a little bit before we go to sleep, you know, because it's it's not a checklist thing it's a, it's a kind of like a reward i was never big on giving prizes and i still feel um that children don't really love prizes that much they get tired of them if they're if they're super expensive they're not prizes they're toys and if they're really cheap I, you find them you know lying around so I, I, i'd say an incentive would be an activity and we're talking about activities in the creative arts that's that can be turning on music and everybody dancing around with objects like ribbons or stuffed animals. You know, you can do all kinds of fun things, dancing with the Safer Torah, stuffed Safer Torah, if it's the right season, you know. Um, so there's just a wide variety of things you can do to motivate kids and say, okay, as soon as everyone's ready for bed, I'll read you a story or we can write a poem together or you can tell me, you know, you'll, you'll tell the story and I'll write it down. Or I'll tell a story to everybody. You know, these are the things that kids love. And it really gets them moving. My kids love um, dance parties that are glow in the dark. Like anything glow yes. in the dark. It could be a finger thing. Yeah. It could be those right. necklace. Like yeah. lights off, music on, glow in the dark. And it's like, right. So I ask you, does a mother have to be a musician to do that? If a mother right. says, oh, I'm not creative. But everyone can get those glow in the dark, you know, things and turn off lights and everybody dances or buy the kids little flashlights. Not the ones that can hurt their eyesight you know those laser ones i hate that's those right. but yeah but the glow in the dark things and have a dance party what like that's a very much a creative activity and to make it again more interesting and for children to sort of learn a little bit about music i noticed that like mara music and those kind of teachers of music they'll have different tempos 
So the children dance slowly to the slow music and quickly to the fast music and march to the march music. And I, I would say it's clear that we're using, we're talking now about Nagunit. We're talking now about Jewish music or, you know, something that's very, very Jewish. So it's, it's Hanuk friendly. It's the, it's a great way to end the day or to get the, before they do their homework and they're all bouncing off the walls. It's a wonderful way, wonderful way to get that energy out. So I guess what I'm really saying is that it's for a mother to have to think of activities in the home, but in the end, it is so worth it. Is most of us have worked as camp counselors or teachers at some point. Most of it, even people to, who don't consider themselves teachers have, have worked with children at some point. And knowing that after a, you know, a jumping around activity, they kind of need a slower, softer activity. That after school, they need a snack. This, this is just the planning of the day and making room for creativity. I think it's just, that's that's where, that's about my... The same path. way I plan a menu, I, I plan exactly. like... It's so interesting. I never thought of it that way, but it makes so much sense. See, I'm curious like um, what you think in terms of the difference between open-ended art, like here's a crayon and a paper versus like, let's draw 770 or the base of Mikdash. How do you do it? Well, when it's just a creative expression, a child, I mean, there are, there are actually, there's art development. You know, the way doctors ask you when you come in, does your child say mama? Does your child point? Does your child, you know, take a step? They ask for, so art development usually starts in the same way. A child will take a crayon or a marker, something that makes marks and a paper <laughs> or the tray of the high chair. And they, they kind of go back and forth with a scribbling motion. And that's the very beginning, which is just, oh, look, this thing makes a mark on that thing. So it's more of a scientific experiment necessarily than art, but that's how it starts. And then as chi children get more sophisticated, their scribbles take more of a form, more of a circular form. So they start doing what kids like to call mishka babble, which is rounded shapes. And then as their fine motor coordination advances, you'll start to see rudimentary representations of things, um, which... But the, but that can be in any direction. So I have examples of this where my kids would draw like a bunch of figures. They'd say, this is our family, upside down, backwards, you know, and some have just eyes, some have no eyes, some, you know, they haven't quite figured out arms. But that's also fascinating to watch as they draw themselves. Sometimes that's the only prompt they need. They'll say, oh, let's draw a picture of what we did yesterday. And you never know what the, what's going to be there. Um and that the fun part is letting them tell you, like, what was your favorite thing that happened this week? Let's draw that. Or even if they're not, you know, not very happy, you say, oh, you look so sad. Let's draw sad. And you never know what you're going to get. But mm -hmm. again, as, as self-expression, it works amazingly well. And if you do take your children to 770 and you, you know, you say, oh, we went to 770. Let's draw. Let's draw something about that. And it's really nice to keep a portfolio of, of children's drawings so they can look through them. You can hang some up. Um, my one a piece of advice, if you can, is never let them see you throw it out. <laughs> no, you can't keep everything, but they can't see that you throw it out. They can't find it in the garbage. Yes, that would be terrible. So try to keep it for an extended period of time. So, And um, I actually kept kind of a, a, I don't know, a nachas file. But whenever the kids do something particularly touching or beautiful, I kept it. So I have, you know, some of my kids are Precious whatever, ones. in their 20s and 30s. And I still oh, have yeah. the things that were amazing. Like they draw, sometimes the next stage of drawing after the scribble stage is, um, you know, the, the more refined scribbling. And then they get into, um, they, you know, if, if we, if you keep coloring books away from them, <laughs> what, don't, so they go from the scribbling to the better scribbling. And then they go to something called the pre-schematic stage where they just drawing things. And I think what happens is, at least I noticed with some of my kids, they will draw something. Let's say they draw a circle and then they make a bunch of dots in it. And then they look up in the you and say, that's a chocolate chip cookie. So you're like, hmm, okay. That does look like a chocolate chip cookie. Look at that. And when Tati comes home, you can say, you know, don't bear drew a chocolate chip cookie today. And here it is. It's on the fridge or whatever. So that's an interesting thing when they, when they're just experimenting and it starts looking like something things like represent things right right and then there's the schematic stage of drawing which i think all your listeners will remember do you remember when you were like six and you knew how to draw a picture if someone said a crown. Draw me a if you picture. told me to make a crown i knew exactly how to make a crown right exactly or a fish you know that right. shape with a little thing it's triangle on the end but also schematic drawings can be just your the way kids know they say i can play piano i can play a song and they all play um out of key. Right. So uh, I made like hundreds of pictures of like a flower and, and like a field. Yeah, that's what you Yes, but it was always basically the same picture. Right. Mine was a house 
with a pitched roof, a chimney with smoke coming out of it, which I did not have. I did not grow up in a house with a chimney and smoke <laughs> and a fireplace. And it had, um, it had a triangle roof, right? Like it A had triangle that. roof, a, a lake with a swan. Don't ask me why. But in my first grade class, my friends would say, oh, you're an artist. You know, but basically I drew that same picture over and over and over again. And um, it, it, it's just interesting to see that that's a stage. You know, children aren't trying to represent anything in their environment. They're just drawing a two-dimensional image of something. Awesome. And then for after the schematic stage, there's a transitional stage where very often kids try to represent something. And when they get to that stage, it's so much fun. Like I once went on a vacation with the kids and on this trip, every single day, we sat down and we drew the interesting things that we experienced that day. Oh, like a journal. So, it's so it interesting. It was like a journal and it could be done of children with any degree of art ability. It didn't matter and was so interesting because some of the younger kids had more technical skill than some of the older kids. Like our boys in yeshiva don't really get any art training. So it was just, it was interesting to see what they drew. And I also drew some things because in the environment, you know, it was a, it was a lot of nature. So they drew trees. One night there were fireworks. So a kid who couldn't really draw just did a, just a bunch of scribbles on the page and said, these are fireworks. So that went into the folder. We kept it. But there was no evaluation. This is a good picture. Oh, mine mine is not good. Because well, what if they so ask you? What if they come over to you and they go, yeah. mommy, is that good? Uh, mommy, okay. Mommy, is okay. it good? So so when you have a mommy, is it good or do you like it? One of the most powerful tools in communication, not just for art, but in everything, is descriptive praise. If you want children to enjoy drawing and continue to draw, the worst thing to say is something that is just global, such as, I love it, it's gorgeous, you're an artist. It's beautiful. Is it good? Yes, it's so good. Most kids will reject praise like that. And have you ever heard, have you ever seen that when you work with kids? I know you ran day camp for a long time. And yeah, no, it's terrible. It's so not good. Yes, it's so ugly. Mine's the worst. And they sometimes will crumple it up and try to throw it away. So that kind of praise is just like too much pressure. But what really gets kids thinking and 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 accepting the praise is when you give evidence of what they've done. You stop for a moment. It's not easy. We did this exercise a lot in the seminary class. And it was so difficult to just say, instead of that's beautiful, you're so talented. You say, I see a happy smile. I see the color blue. I see you did dot, 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 you know, line, line, line. I see you did wavy, wavy, wavy. Because sometimes it's just scribbles, right? I see you went around and around. Um, and eventually you can say, oh, I see a sun, a cloud, and a blue sky. It reminds me of a happy summer day. That is like giving them candy. I can't explain. It's they, they stop for a minute and they go, yes, yes, I did all that. Even if they don't say it out loud, you can see how their pride in their work grows when you stop for a minute and say, you know, and especially if you're drawing with your family, with kids of a certain age all together, it helps them not compare one to the other. Oh, I see you drew the tree that we took, you know, pictures under yesterday and you drew the building next to it with all the windows and then so each one has something that you've described, that you've noticed, and that you are remarking on. And if a mother is not artistic, she doesn't have to draw with her kids. You just have to let them show you what matters to them. So we did this exercise also with the students. We, we, had, we borrowed a preschool class, divided up the seminary students with the kids. And by using descriptive praise, um, the teacher said it was unbelievable. She said, my class rarely draws. They're not interested in the art table. They don't go, they don't use the crayons and markers. This is not going to work. But when they had a seminary student sitting there going, wow, you've, you've chosen pink. Mm -hmm. I see you use a lot of pink. All of a sudden, the child was like, pink is my favorite color. Yeah. And I see I see someone in the bed. My mommy just had a new baby. But oh my gosh, all this stuff started opening up and pouring out. And they were talking about what's happening in their lives. And this particular experience took place in the beginning of the school year. We had a lot of rainbows because they had just learned the Parsha. Oh, and it was just this stunning, like, I don't know, experience of what, it, how much it means to a child to be able to express themselves in this way. So I feel like we spoke a lot about art, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and when we started off, we, we were speaking a little about music. So I, like, what other examples, what are other creative arts that are interesting to children that we could talk about? Well, I'm a very big believer in storytelling. And again, I don't think it's possible for anybody 
to say, well, I'm not creative. I can't tell a story. I believe it's the responsibility of parents to tell the stories, family stories that the kids are not going to hear anywhere else. So you might say, okay, I'm not the best storyteller. So they're going to hear the story of Nachal Mishgamzu in school. And they will. That's fine. If you love telling stories, by all means, you know, do it. Kids will. And plus, it's wonderful because you can put them into bed, sit down. The lights are out and all they have to do is listen. So it's not even like reading a book before bed, which sometimes certain kids get very stimulated by reading books before bed. And and then they yell there, I can't see the baby is banging on the book and you're trying to nurse someone while you're trying to read to three other kids. It, it doesn't always work as well as, <laughs> as it does like, you know, in your mind. But storytelling can be extremely, extremely effective and something that they look forward to every night. They will do a lot to get a story out of you. Um, and it's interesting. I have this book called uh, The the Teachings of Rebbe on Chinuch. Have you seen that? I, I, I think yeah, it's, it's so interesting. It's amazing. And on this podcast, so many yeah. people have, you know, ended up coming back to that same book. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have it yet, go out yes. and buy it because it's <laughs> incredible. Yes. It's amazing. And we were talking about the Rebbe. The Rebbe had the entire world on his shoulders, but yet the Rebbe has something to say about every single one. When I looked up these topics... Like storytelling, the Rebbe has something to say about storytelling in childhood. And what does the Rebbe say? The Rebbe encouraged the telling of true stories from Tanakh. Obviously, you don't want to like emphasize like <laughs> blood and gore or the very violent ones before bed, maybe. But, you know, us telling the story of, of Eureka and the walls came tumbling down. It's Kids love that. They would love that story. My mother told me the story of Rivka at the well. And because I was so fond of it, it became the book Kind Little Rifka. Kind Little Rifka. It's a story I wanted to tell. Exactly. I love that story. Right. And the um, also talks about like um, stories of Sadiqim in general, right? Like not Sadiqim in general stories, but also I would include, and I think this is so important, and my assignment to the seminary students was to, to perform a story, because the storytelling is kind of a performance, right? To prepare the story so that you don't stop in the middle and go, um, what happened next? You know, like to prepare the events, to tell it nicely of something that none of us had heard before. So it had to be family stories. And I'm telling you, Sarla, that at some points, the room was just, you could have heard a pin drop. Because the stories of Mysterious Nefesh and the stories of funny stories even of like their father was on the Tzayim and this happened and that happened. Great stories. If it hadn't been an assignment, I mean, and, and sitting in that classroom with, I don't know, it was like 30 students, we, it was like a journey. We learned something about each other that we didn't know before. There's stories of a great, a great, great grandmother going to a mikvah in a icy river with two friends. And every time she went into that icy cold water, she lost consciousness and the friends had to pull her out. And going in again, like, our, I'm telling you, our jaws were on the floor. Some of the stories you were can't, just, You can't hear this if you're listening, but, like, my mouth is open. Yes, it was, it was that. exactly. Yeah, so wow. I urge mothers and fathers, of course, to, to sit down and think about the family stories, the history of your own family. Yeah, I grew up with it. You know, I, I, you know, I give my father a lot mm -hmm. of credit for that. He told us all the stories of yes. communist Russia. Yes, yes. Um, and my mother, my grandmother also. used to tell us the stories of the wars, like right. growing up in Israel, 1948 and 1967. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they lived through these wars and everything. So, And I believe that family stories are very empowering. My mother was a storyteller. I mean, she was, she could turn a, a simple incident into a, a side-splitting or heart-rending story. She was just a storyteller. Um, but we grew up with the stories of her grandmother and her mother. And, you know, what the, the kind of, you know, the way life was back then. So the, this also helps uh, to encourage the respect for your elders. I really think so. Think of what Bubby did. You know, how could she have done that when she was only six? It's like, you know, so. All wow, good, great. You right? think of Bubby as Bubby. You don't think of her that she was once. Exactly. Six. So. So when parents say, well, how do I teach my kids keep it of aim? Why do they open up a chutzpah? I mean, it's a big topic. But, you know, this, I, this is just a fantastic way, an indirect way of getting across to the kids all the things you really want them to know and to learn. Respect for other people, you know, um, appreciation for who they are. You know, even when you give them a bracing message after a story like that, 
in this family, we do whatever we can for other people. After you tell them a story of, you know, your whoever had an open house or gave away food to the poor, whatever story, whatever is your family is all about, the kids need to know that. And there's no better way than stories. And what's wonderful about the creative arts is that they all blend together. So after you tell your kids a wonderful story, or while you're telling the story, if they're not in bed, they can be drawing it at the same time. And drawing a story when a kid is, you know, not yet able to write, it's a very rudimentary form of note taking. And I used to do this when I taught second grade. I'd give the kids paper, say, now, you know, I'll tell the story. You, and when they drew what I said, they were able to then look at their visual notes and remember all the events in the story. It was really interesting exercise. But that, you know, that could be a wonderful thing to do to, you know, to tell a story the next day, you draw the story and your whole week, it's like uplifted. So it's amazing. But I'm also, you know, I'm also a little exhausted hearing that. Like, what, how do you find the time and energy for like all this creativity? You know, there's, there's the, I, you know, tick, tick, tick. I want them to do homework. I want them to eat supper. I want them to take a bath. I want them to go to bed. Like, right. how do you fit that in? So I always felt that when I was trying to save time, it, it I expended the time and the energy and in, 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 in not in a positive way. Like either I was yelling at everybody, chasing them around to get in their pajamas, or I finally gave in and I would say, as soon, not if you get in pajamas, I'll tell you a story, but as soon as you're in pajamas, it's time for a story. It's just so motivating, right? Because what's at the end of it for them? Bedtime. Kids hate bedtime. So why should they rush? <laughs> when you look <laughs> <laughs> when you look at it from their point of view, right? There's They're absolutely right. <laughs> you want them in bed, but they don't want to be in bed. <laughs> so yes, um, that's where the time is. The time is there anyway. It's either being aggravated or it's it's leaning in. So this is like a, just a positive way where they're getting into pajamas, but this way it's for a story instead of just because you ran out of patience. Exactly. And what happens when you run out of patience? Um, yeah, we, it's not easy. we close the video, we'll close the recording. <laughs> right. But, but when you examine how you spend the majority of your day and the very, very limited time of childhood, childhood lasts for a very brief amount of time. So the clock is ticking more on transmitting values to our kids. Every minute we spend telling them, hurry up, get up, eat your bags of potato, don't forget your snack, hang up your coat, is another minute that it's not really values based. You know what I'm saying? It's so, so much easier. How do you incorporate the value? Like, how do you incorporate creativity into the bath time? Into the how do you get some like that drama positive value into okay. the routine? So, okay, well, I'll, let's say for example, I like to rhyme. So there were some evenings when I would talk in rhyme. Oh. And that would be more fun for them. I'd say, you know, or sing it. I would sing songs about hanging up your coat. And they'd think it was funny and they'd hang up the coat, you know, like nothing's happening in this house until we hang up our coats. You know, like it, it could be <laughs> as dumb or silly as that. And, um, you know, ugh, singing songs about washing their hands. You know, look, you, you ladies, we're doing it anyway. So by trying to take on a little bit of the perspective of the children on the other, on the receiving end, you see how this can be such a wonderful, um, positive and values based kind of thing because you want to teach you don't just want them to wash your their hands because you said so i mean kabbalah is very important but what you really want is for them to internalize the idea that before we eat food we wash our hands or you know but before we go to sleep we say shema or hashem's always watching over us or you know we hold hands in the street these these are things you know both safety and values it's what we we have a very brief time to teach them all these things right we touched on storytelling. We touched on art. What about like acting, like play acting? Not so much storytelling on the side of the mother, but mm -hmm. like the kids. You know, we yes. have shows in our building. You remember that? Yes. We yes. We all, uh, uh, what was it? Friday night? Everyone did shows. <laughs> we, we <have> shows. <laughs> it was so great. But yes, drama, creative drama for children is fantastic. My mother actually was taught creative dramatics in the Pittsburgh Public Schools. She took a course and it was it's a very interesting way of approaching drama because when we think of kids acting in a play, the first thing we think of is memorizing lines and everybody doing it together. Say, welcome, oh, welcome to our little play. 
all the parents are here today. Now we <laughs> creative drama is quite different. Creative drama is could be trying on a particular part of somebody inspiring, and then having the ch- each child try it on and do it, where, where, and make up their own lines and make up their own words. So, for example, if you're telling the children the story of Purim and you're, they're on their way to bed, let's say, you can say, let's all walk like Queen Esther. How do you think she walked on her way to Ahasuerus? How do you think she, or, you know, it's very creative, but the mother doesn't have to be an actress to do this. Again, this is just a fun, this is a way for children to internalize everything that they're learning. And do you think the Rebbe has something to say about children acting? Of course. Of course. <laughs> you wouldn't be wrong if you thought so. The Rebbe said something that I think is so fascinating and opens up a whole other channel in Chinuch. Spoke about children not acting out, even temporarily, saying lines and acting in a way that Haman would act. So I thought that was fascinating because I don't know if most people realize this. Like, how do you do a perm play if nobody's Haman? Right. And, right. But but that means that the, the kid takes on the characteristic of whoever he's acting. If the Rebbe said not to be Haman. Yes even for a brief moment, to talk like Haman, to say words like Haman, to have that attitude. Because I guess the Reb was, I mean, obviously the Reb was saying that, that's, it, it's its an art to... Um, but there's always a bad guy in the story. How do you avoid that? Well, one of the assignments for the students was to find stories that don't have a bad guy, so that everyone, and a story that has lots of parts. So they came up with some excellent choices. Uh-huh. Um, there's uh, the two brothers, for example. Oh, so there's a story of a one brother who has a lot of children and a wife, one brother who is all alone, and they bump into each other. It's so much fun right, for them to right. act that out. There's so many p- good parts, and they can and and the of course the mother who's there can say, "Oh, I see you have a lot of. Ch- why do you need so much wheat? And why do you need so much wheat? You can facilitate and sort of be part of the play if the kids get stuck. But it's it's so much fun. So one day you tell them the story. One day they act it out, and then at the end the two brothers hug each other. So once you have that little experience with your kids then i think it's useful when they have a fight for you to say but but the two brothers love each other you know i mean it'll be annoying but it's worth the risk yes it's worth the risk right two brothers who love each other that was one of my rhymes that i used to say when the kids got a little on each other's nerves but you know Um, i have like my younger set of kids and my older set of kids like everything we're talking about is so much fun but i feel like a lot of it is center towards younger kids like how does this kind of evolve into like preteen teenagers like how does that work okay well i will say this when we did the family trip and everyone had to draw every day so that Mm -hmm. was everybody and one trip we took um we bought a journal and everyone had to write something every day it was a trip to eric's my husband wrote my husband wrote an entry i wrote an entry the kids wrote an entry. It was so cute to read because sometimes the thing they wrote would be like, showers in Eretz Yisrael are weird. <laughs> and my husband was writing all about Eretz HaKodesh and, you know, whatever. It was just so cute to have the different perspectives, you know. That's Today so I special. found a store that doesn't sell anything except watermelons. Like, only in Eretz Yisrael, right? Yeah. Like, everyone in Eretz Yisrael should just be safe and secure. We should uh, Amen. triumph in Eretz, in Eretz Israel. And yeah, I did want to mention this to you because when kids have big feelings, and I don't know how much your kids know and how much they've processed anything that's happening in Eretz Israel, but you know, kids can have very big feelings. So the creative arts are so important. Journal writing, writing poems, drawing pictures. Sometimes when you sit down to talk about a picture, is it good? You'll say, oh, to me, this looks like... You drew the kaiso, and they'll say, "Yeah, I'm worried about X, Y." You know, something else will happen when you describe what you see. A child feels it's safe to open up and then make it a conversation. So there's that. And when the whole family, when everybody gets involved in something like that, of course, the tweens and teens, even though officially they're too sophisticated for it, they'll take part. And I would say, when it comes to teenagers, then if they express an interest in an instrument, that's a good time for them to learn some skill. So it's not just strumming on a guitar to be creative or scribbling to be creative, but if they if they show an a, you know an interest in something, that's a good time to say you know are you open to having lessons? Would you like to have? Um, can I arrange for you to go to a a clay studio and do some ceramics? You know you never know what's going to interest a child, and we're so lucky now that in Crown Heights there are there are places where kids can learn to dance and and can be part of productions. 
and you know, right, get that. Right. It's so fun. You know, going back a second to what you were saying before about, you know, kids drawing their feelings for Yisrael, there was I, somebody WhatsApped me that they were collecting pictures for Chayalim. And my son's Rebbe actually asked the pictures, you know, the kids to make pictures. And that was also so fascinating. I asked my five-year-old, you know, make a, a right. Would you like to draw a picture to give Chizok to a soldier in Eretz Yisrael? And his picture was so cute. He literally had, like, in one picture there was dreidels. Dreidels. Fine. That's how right. it's Chizok. Right. But in another picture there was Tzamach with a Tehillim. Like, there was a little boy with a Tehillim. And he made, it was just so cute. He made a few green things that were the soldiers. Yes. And he had a, he had a Tyra and he had a shul. It was like a full, he, he gave me his explanations and mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was beyond precious and every age could, you know, we have the, right, right. Tell them with them and they did raffles and, and everything. But it was, it's so interesting because I, I didn't think about it in the same way till we just brought it up now in conversation about mm -hmm. using art also to provide physics. I feel like you're doing something to help uh -huh. in a certain way, you know? What I love about him giving you the long explanation and something that I could suggest is ask his permission. Can I write that down either on the back of the picture or under each thing? Because that's, you know, the children, then they get really into it. They'll say, and write this and write that the sun is shining and write that it's daytime. You know, they'll start telling you stuff. And right. really what that is, is a very you know primitive form of a picture book. It's Basically, they draw a picture, and they tell you what the action is or what the feelings are. And then you have something, like you said, it's very precious. You have something you don't want to throw away. Yeah. Right, right. And you'll see as, as you get more and more art projects from school that were made, either made by adults or crafts projects that were, you know, valuable in terms of a child learning to follow directions. But the finished product is not coming from the heart. It's a skill. It's a very different thing. And when a child just draws something or makes something, says, oh, this, this is for you. This is you, mommy. This is us on the bus when we went to, you know, the doctor or something. Like, I don't know. Or in the car. Like, there, then it becomes very personal. And then something that you really want to kind of keep in a folder. And I know that my kids, when they come home, they still look at some of their early writings and pictures and laugh their heads off because I've saved these things. Right. And then it instead of it just being like your kid came home from school, like, how was your day? It was good. It's like you, you have these all this almost like this like buffet of options, how to have, you know, more meaningful conversations because they start making these pictures, it's, you know, exactly. Oh. Suddenly it all comes out. And that's why there's something called quality time, but I'm a big believer in quantity time. So even if you're just, you know, if you're in the kitchen, you're cutting up a salad, you're not interacting directly with your child, but knowing that you're there and available is step one. Sitting down and noticing what they're doing and giving them these opportunities, that just creates a sense of fun and a sense of joy in the home. And the more we bring joy and warmth into the home, that's really where the heart of parenting lies because everything hinges on it. Their their emotional health, their mental health, and their from kite. If the house is a... Their, their spiritual health. Right. Right. Their spiritual health. So if the house is a place where there's warmth, where you know that you can get an adult's attention and you can talk something out and that your feelings are welcome and that your ideas are valued, this all goes toward building something so much bigger than just, oh, you know, it's a great way to spend time before we throw them into bed. You know, I was Which gonna, it is. Ask you, yeah. I was going to ask if you have any final messages, but I kind of feel like that is the, the, the most powerful message. Yes. This, okay. There's so much bonding that takes place when these things happen in a home. And again, this descriptive praise, this goes for everything. Mommy, mommy, look at the dance I'm doing. So you see a kid doing a little kid dance. What are you going to say? Most of the time without thinking, oh, that's gorgeous. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, you're great. It's so dismissive. I don't know if, if you, 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 my, hear, you know that. Is I love it. My go-to is I love it. <laughs> I love it. Right. But it, this, this requires I'm, more. This requires. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. put more effort into that. You did step, step, spin, step, step, spin, you know, it help. It's evidence-based. It's saying, I know right. you, this is what you did. And I'm noticing every bit of it. It is such a powerful thing. It seems so simple, you know, so silly almost. And it also says, it makes me feel, it makes it makes me think of a butterfly. In other words, you say you say what you see, and then you say how it makes you feel or what it reminds you of. And the child then just gets so full on that. It's just a wonderful thing. And honestly, I've 
tried to incorporate that also in, my, in re- other relationships with adults and coworkers. And when you notice what someone did, you walk in and you say, you know, this office is so organized. You have a real talent for organization. I never would have thought of putting the things in this in this way. It makes it makes it better for all of us here. That is a real compliment. But if you if you know if someone says if you see somebody on shops, you look gorgeous. You look gorgeous, and the person's going, "No, I don't. I don't really." It's so different than if you say, "You should always wear that color blue. It brings out your eyes." That's a compliment that's descriptive, right? right? right. And that took a little bit of noticing. And that's why it means so much more. So interesting because, you know, we planned on doing this podcast, you know, before the war broke out. And when, the you know, with the current situation at Israel, I was feeling like almost like, does all other programming going on pause? Like this is on our mind and we're davening. But as I'm talking to you and we're, we're wrapping up this conversation, I'm realizing that that our, we we have to be there for our children. And yes, our Israel is on our mind and we're davening for them and we're we're doing what we can. But at the same time, we need to be able to, to be present, to have day to day, our children still need the regular normal routine to the best of our ability and our support in other words chinuch doesn't stop because there's a war chinuch continues it's it's actually it's taking so much emotional energy right now just to hold it it's it's very difficult to hold it all at the same time but yes the children still need they need to have a mother who is happy whose eyes light up when they come in who's you know and and at the risk of repeating what everyone else says i don't think that cell phones are are the enemy I just think of looking at anything else when they need you as the enemy. It doesn't matter if it's a book, a phone, a newspaper, <laughs> something out the window, you know, anything that distracts us. Of course, the phone is the, you know, we, for most of us, it's the culprit. Yeah, if it, all these wonderful things happen when you can put the phone aside and put other heartaches aside and really throw yourself into it and lean in to the wonderful joy that children can be. Because they're going to, you're going to spend those you know, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. It's going to be hectic. You know, you might as well try to find a way to enjoy it. Try to find incentives for them to do what you're asking. Because really, if, if children listen to every single thing you tell them, they do their homework, they lay out their clothes for the next day, they've taken a bath, they brush their teeth. And it's just so they can do it again tomorrow. That's it. Right. But here we're injecting meaning and purpose. And, and also, and fun and education. Because frankly, when you talk in rhyme, or you read a book, or you, you, you gain chinuch references. Then the next day when you go out with your kids, you can say, oh, look what's on the street. Does anybody see that? What's the very best place for a penny? And they pick <laughs> it up and they bring it home. And it, right? Or you're in the park and you say, when a, when a parent says, let's go, we say yes, we don't say no. And everybody is supposed to come money. Or so someone makes have, a mistake and we say, say sorry yeah. at first. Help to fix it in that. There we go. Oops, I'm sorry. So <laughs> yeah. Wow, this has been so informative, interesting. Mm-hmm. I loved hearing your sing-song voice just here. So I'm sure our children want to hear that from <laughs> us. Thank you so, so much, everyone who listened. Please share this podcast, subscribe to the Optimizing Podcast, Mother's Podcast, and may all of our efforts to insert the chinoch and the fun and the simcha really lead us to the ultimate simcha of Mashiach now. So thank you so, so much, Mrs. Rosa. Amen. Amen. It's a pleasure. And I, I'm, I, I, I'm just sending all the mother, all the young mothers with young kids, all the love. You know, you're doing an amazing job. You're doing a very, very tiring job. So. <laughs> <laughs> and always find a way to try to find a way to enjoy it and have this wonderful experiences with your kids.